Awesome. Well, Anatoly, uh, really excited for this chat. We've done a couple podcasts now, kind of deep diving Solana's tech stack, but I would love to maybe start this conversation in framing Solana and your vision in the end state. Uh, maybe starting there, we can work our way back. Sure. So, like, um, when I first had the idea of what we wanted to build, I thought what was really interesting about the space is that it's a smart contract platform. It's an open platform for developers to, to write new kinds of software that didn't exist before. And two is that it synchronized global information as fast as possible, because that also doesn't exist. You have all these marketplaces around the world, no matter how fast they are, they're very localized. and kind of the faster they are, it's kind of actually worse for a hobbyist or any external user because, you know, there's somebody that's paying $10 million, like, you know, to NASDAQ to get priority access. And you don't have the opportunity to do that even, even if you had the, the money. So, like, to me, that felt like that's an unfair environment and blockchain, Byzantine fault tolerance, it can actually enforce fairness through code. And that's really, really cool. Um, so that, that, that's pr primarily the, you know, the two constraints in the system. How do we make it as fast as physics allow at, at like synchronizing information? How do we make it an open developer platform? Amazing. So being we're at the developer stage, we're definitely going to dive into the tech. Kind of starting with synchronizing that world's information, uh, Solana does all-to-all -all communication. And I think that's really kind of Solana's secret sauce. Can you go a little bit further into that? Yeah, this was also like <laughs> kind of obvious to me, but not obvious to a lot of our, a lot of folks that we were competing with. So basically there was kind of like 2017 cycle of a lot of consensus optimizations. So like, even if you could magically solve consensus, if you have like a limit order on open book or Phoenix or whatever, and you want that order to be fairly distributed to everyone that cares about that order, you got to propagate the data around the world. So even if consensus at zero cost, you're dealing with the application information that needs to be fully propagated. So to me, I thought, like, what does it matter if you optimize consensus if you still have to build this pipeline for propagating like, all the messages from all the applications to everyone else? And you still have to build a pipeline for receiving messages from all the applications in a high throughput way as fair as possible. So you, if you solve those two problems, to me it seemed trivial to build the consensus messaging layer as just another smart contract. Because once you have that all-to-all -all communication pipeline solved, like consensus is trivial to implement. It doesn't matter how much, how many messages it costs to the network because we made messages cheap. That's kind of the whole point. If they were, if they were going to be expensive, not, the system was not going to work anyways. We were not going to be able to solve the, the use case that we really set out to solve. So kind of like some back in the envelope napkin math. This was 2017. We needed like four GPUs for a single machine to saturate one a gigabyte worth of traffic. The cost of that box was like 1,300 bucks um, like a month. And even at that price, it was it, like if you actually priced the transactions fully saturated at that pipe, I think it was like something like 10 to the minus six dollars per transaction. So in my mind, I was like, okay, why, why optimize? Like, why even worry about the academic problem of consensus? Let's just build the software in the in the way that we know, like with systems optimizations, and, and let it rip. Um, so that was basically kind of the the premise and. A lot of the, I kind of, it was like night and day, the reactions that I got from Qualcomm engineers when I showed them, like, this is my plan, this is how we're going to do it, to like academics that were working on um, optimizing like layer ones. So like all the Qualcomm folks were like, oh yeah, this is obvious. <laughs> and really the unique property that Alta all allows is kind of that real-time market data and being able to propagate that around the world. Yep. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how that even kind of contrasts to other ecosystems and uh, how it kind of logically separates uh, the two? 
So if you're like a trader, you're receiving information from a market and it's all these offers and, and, and stuff like being streamed to you. Like normally if the market runs in New York, you want to collocate in New York, so you're physically closest. So you have the shortest link between the marketplace and your machine that makes trading decisions. But the world is big and like actual events that move markets happen anywhere in the world. Right? You can have like some newsworthy event happen in Singapore, that newswire has to travel all the way to New York before that machine sees it and then combines it and synthesizes that with market data, decides that prices are different and they you know, should be different than what they are today, sends an order. Like, but that information still has to travel all the way, all the way to Singapore. So you, if you kind of like think of that problem that way, all you really need to solve is like, how do I synchronize all of the world's information, doesn't matter, doesn't matter where it is, such that a user that has that news event or a transaction can submit it somewhere and like start propagating as fast as possible. So this is kind of where this design idea came from. Let's build a global network. Let's rotate leaders around the world. Let's try to add multiple leaders at the same time so then your distance to the leader is shorter and like increase that number until it becomes shorter and shorter to where you know, you're as close as physics allow. Um, and like that's, that information synchronization problem is the one we're trying to solve because if we can solve it with a global network, it means that by the time a trader sees that newswire and that trader sitting in New York, there's already a transaction moving through Solana that reflects that price movement because somebody in Singapore sent it to the block producer nearest to wherever they live. And there's no arbitrage. It's not like NASDAQ is any better just because they trade sub one millisecond. So this is like that like hyper world of like there's one giant state machine, everything's perfectly synchronized, and it's massively scalable to, to, to house all of finance. Um, Beautiful. I mean, I, and that's, that's well, it's, a, it's a science fiction thing, right? Like it, you gotta, like I, I keep saying it, and I feel like everyone's like just believes it's gonna happen, but it's a lot of work and a lot of really really hard engineering problems. And in my mind, it's still like science fiction, but like we're getting slow, close, slow, slowly and closer and closer to to making it real. So, so let's break apart some of the steps that we need to do, get there. Ultimately, Solana today is doing more transactions than all EVM networks combined, all layer twos, even when you remove the vote overhead. Uh, that was really put forth by a lot of the innovations of Solana with turbine, sea level, et cetera. But there's new things ultimately coming about on the roadmap, and I would love to dive further in, into those. Maybe perhaps starting with concurrent leaders. So there, yeah, so, so there's a couple problems that we need to solve. One is right now there's a single leader at a time in the network, so the probability of you being close to that leader is pretty low, um, simply because it's a global network and it's randomly picked, and users, are, I, I assume, are pretty random too. So the way that you can kind of solve this problem is you have two concurrent leaders. And there's really nothing magical about that. It's just all they're doing is they receive data, they linearize it, they pick the order of events, and they transmit it out as fast as they can. And they don't actually have to execute anything. They just receive the data, order it, and send it out. And two things can do that at the same time. And it doesn't matter if they like submit a double spend because the, the actual order is not the order that the leader makes, it's the order that the validator receives both of those blocks or four of those blocks, and then the validators decide in some deterministic way how to play this all back. So the difficulty here is that the leaders, if they cannot communicate with each other, and because we want the network to be really, really fast, they will not be able to do so, they don't know what the other leader knows about the network. They don't know what fork they're gonna pick, and that means that they can have divergent views of the state, so they can start picking different forks, and if both of them pick different forks, that creates a fork of an, of an of itself, and that like kind of forking explodes out, right? The number of permutations of what the heaviest fork is kind of grows exponentially. So you have to have a way to kind of clamp that growth down and, and resolve it. Um, and the way that 
we're doing that is kind of in a similar way as forking is resolved at the physical layer today. And this is actually like a very lucky, clever optimization. You like rarely get lucky like this, but the way that erasure codes propagate around the network is when you're receiving this data, it's a very similar high-level idea to data availability sampling. You receive a bunch of ch ch uh, chunks of your block from a bunch of different validators. And if you can reconstruct the block, it's very likely that everyone else can reconstruct the block because you received a very large number of samples of this block from different di nodes. So you kind of get this uh, like effectively sampling that you're doing in the rest of the network, and you're sampling erasure codes, and that gives you um, real-time guarantees that everyone else is also receiving the data, and they can also reconstruct that same data structure. Because it doesn't really matter, like, for folks who don't know what erasure coding is, it's kind of this magical polynomial algorithm that folks discovered in the 70s where you take any chunk of data, doesn't matter what it is, and you, like, if you remember from high school, you can draw a polynomial through a bunch of dots, and then you can, you can basically figure out the function of that polynomial just from three points. Well, you take any chunk of data, you draw the polynomial through those points, you can figure out the function of this polynomial, and then you can extend it with more dots. And if you receive any number of these dots right, from this polynomial, you can reconstruct the function, and therefore you can reconstruct the data. So it's this beautiful mathematical trick, and it allows you to have very high data loss but recover the, the entire data set. Um, and because of this trick, when you recover the block, you have guarantee that everyone else can recover the block. And that eliminates the forks at this like, physical layer. Um, so as long as there's enough erasure codes, you can actually avoid forking in the network. And the only thing that you need to have more erasure codes is more cores, more CPUs. And if there's not enough cores today, there will be twice as many two years from now. So we kind of get this like, very lucky break. Um, Ironically, it's almost the same thing that occurred with CDMA. Uh, they also use erasure coding and, and this like, kind of magic trick. So in some ways, I'm like replaying Qualcomm's journey uh, <laughs> through an area, but through like later ones. The, the wireless network background definitely is very uh, applicable to yeah. blockchain. Uh, ultimately, with the multiple kind of leaders, can you also chat through how that affects MEV? So like um, MEV is this kind of inherent problem to public networks, uh, and you can't really get rid of it at all. But we can make it as competitive as possible. And my feeling is that like solutions that try to hide it kind of push the MEV to some other layer that, if that layer is corrupted, can extract 100 percent of it. Um, and my feeling is that if you can, if you really want a totally permissionless network where you assume that there is no layer that has remained honest, that you need to maximize that competition because competition will effectively drive the extraction to the minimum amount. Um, so the way MEV works is that with a single leader, if all the data is being, arrives to that leader, that leader can reorder events. They can insert their own events ahead or, or after. And those events could be trades. And if you're receiving a bunch of buys and a bunch of sells, um, I don't know if you've ever had this experience in the 90s with a bank that reordered your withdrawals and deposits to create an overdraft. That's MEV. <laughs> so if you were a student in college in the, in the whatever, late 90s, early aughts, I'm sure you had this happen to your bank account in college. That's effectively MEV. The bank is screwing you because they want to make sure you get an overdraft. So this is what a malicious block producer can do. But if you have two of them, all of a sudden, there's now competition for this. And that means that you as a user can select whichever block producer you know ahead of time is the least or the most honest or offers the best re rebate. And you kind of have this economic competition, which is great. And that competition, because it's a competition within well-known entities that are publicly advertised, they're stake, they have brands, they're trying to attract stake on the network that actually creates a nice market, and markets tend to do a really good job when they're competitive uh, at like, creating fairness. So that's, that's really like the foundational goal there, is to create as fair of an environment. And um, 
in the true implementation with multiple concurrent leaders, uh, both leaders have full functionality. There's nothing different between them. They have full control of which fork they can pick, how, which ordering they pick. And that means there's no like distinct, the user can actually pick one or the other, and neither one can affect uh, that choice. So that really creates a fair environment. There's other solutions that try to do proposer builder separation. In fact, I, I proposed one as well, like a design that's similar to that. Um, those all have caveats. If there is like a proposer that is malicious, they can reject builders. And then if they're colluding with a builder, they can reject the honest builder and they have the colluding builder extract all the MEV. And these things are probably unlikely right now in a world where I think most operators in the world on permissionless networks are honest, but we have to kind of plan for the worst case. So um, I would like to build a system that is like worst case uh, resilient. Um, so, but that takes more work, you know. And multiple blocks or multiple leaders are ultimately just one of the few technologies yep. that are on the roadmap. Another one of those being really a pretty big upgrade to C-level. Can you talk about some of the things that are going into C-level and the upgrades there? Yeah, um, the way that the, we built the runtime was to maximize parallelism. And we had a small team. Uh, we literally took Berkeley Packet Filter and used that as a virtual machine because it was battle tested at Linux. It's probably high performance. Um, and there was like a C compiler for it. <laughs> so that, we thought that was good enough, even though I kind of shuddered at the thought of people writing smart contracts in C. So we invested a lot of work to get Rust to work and build tooling for that. But you're still dealing with a very limited uh, bytecode. So some things that people take for granted as higher level developers, like um, the ability to like, introspect the code, like actually know what the names of the structures and fields are, that's missing because the code is not typed. Uh, the ability to call between programs, like uh, in, most, in most modern day virtual machines, you can actually call functions between different environments. Um, in Solana right now, you have to write these pack and unpack instructions and actually serialize the data, then deserialize it. And that's a huge pain in the butt. Um, so all these improvements that we know we had to do, we just didn't have the time. And now uh, the team is big enough to where they're working on adding a full type system to, the, to Berkeley Packet Filter. What's cool is that we don't have to invent it. Uh, Berkeley uh, BPF type format, which was developed by the Linux folks, is something that they're adding to the kernel as well. So we get to, again, stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, the work that we're doing is uh, the, robu like the ro robust Rust integration, also working on adding move support, so like another high-level language uh, that can leverage those, those types. And once that's ready, you get this really like full linkage. So when a transaction is, uh, is when the virtual machine for the transaction is created, all the programs can call each other without any memory copies because we know the exact types of every exported symbol from every program. And during that linkage, you can actually verify that the register refers to the right type from the right account that, comes, that is referenced by the transaction. So no memory copies and safety and developer experience. You really rarely get all three like improvements with one change. And we are getting all three of those, and it, it's really, really awesome. It is amazing. In terms of kind of trade-offs, often there's no free lunch, but one unique uh, upcoming feature to the Solana ecosystem will be asynchronous program execution, uh, where you really have kind of an amazing benefit, uh, really at no cost. Could you talk about that? Yeah, th this is another proposal, like one of, one of the problems that the, all the, the core devs are working towards. And um, the reason for this is that, um, like right now, the way Solana works is uh, a block producer, when they're proposing the block, they actually execute transactions as they come in and they stream the block out. So they're doing both the work of execution and creating the block and scheduling. Uh, technically, the only thing that they need to do is just scheduling. So they just need to figure out how to pack the block and, and transmit it out. They don't need to do any execution. 
that means that a block producer doesn't need to even have the account state. They can actually just guess which transactions are valid. And, that, and guessing is that pretty easy to build to have very, very high fidelity, like high percentage, like hit rate. And the system should be tolerant with invalid transactions because that's just dead bytes. And it doesn't really matter if a few bytes are, are dead or not. Um, so that could make the block producer separate it from the rest of the validator. It could run as a separate process. It could run on a totally separate network card, like a totally separate interface, um, which creates a lot of redundancy because the block producer is what's receiving untrusted traffic from the rest of the internet that's usually malicious. You have to, <laughs> and like can, can spike, and it's much, much easier to build a very highly reliable system if the component of the system that's receiving untrusted traffic can be killed and restarted without any state and moved around the world like arbitrarily. So that, that's just a, a huge safety improvement and performance improvement. On the receiving side, when you're receiving this data, um, the only thing that consensus really needs to do is to pick a fork. It actually doesn't really care about state execution, what the value of the transactions are. Like, none of that stuff matters. Like, did you receive the data? Is the data that you receive the same as everyone else? If so, then you can pick the fork. And that decision, uh, if we made the, the validator only make that decision to pick forks, it means that execution can run asynchronously to, the, to fork choice and can effectively also run on a separate box if you wanted to do that. But most importantly, it can run in the background and sometimes it could take longer than 400 milliseconds. Sometimes it could take shorter. And that allows the rest of the system kind of much more uh, leeway in making sure that blocks are exactly 400 milliseconds or 300 milliseconds. Because the only thing that it's, we're tuning there is data propagation. We're not dealing with like cache misses in the account state or memory contention, all, all this other stuff that comes with execution. Um, which makes it a lot easier, like a much, much easier programming challenge. Um, so those are like kind of the two things that we want to make asynchronous. Can we make block production separate from running a validator? If so, the system's going to be much safer. It's much, that node can be uh, much, much faster at picking blocks. It could spend more time, you know, like doing JITO, MEV stuff, or like building a faster scheduler. All that stuff is good. If the blocks are propagated and received and the nodes vote without actually executing them, it means there's never some crazy miscalculated instruction that takes way more time than the compute units estimated that makes blocks lower. There's no jitter. Like the system can be much, much more finely tuned. And it's much safer to go from 400 milliseconds to 200 and then maybe 120. Like, so that, those are like really like the fundamental challenges that we have in like getting to that speed of light is that like we're running on permissionless systems anyone can bring whatever box they want that means there's going to be differences in latencies and all these other things so we want to eliminate as much of that as we can from the synchronous block propagation changing leader to uh to make that asynchronous and kind of run in the background it's a, it's, a, it's it really is amazing. Uh, I, I hope you appreciate the level of engineering and thought. It's, it, it is truly remarkable. So like, all I really do is like, I talk about these things, and I write docs, and I try to convince like, Richard from Fire Dancer and like, the folks that are like, fighting fires and like, building stuff and like, trying to fix bugs and optimize things to like, kind of pull their heads up and be like, OK, these are good ideas. How do I, like, as I do the work, the day-to-day -day work, how do I make sure that we're moving in that direction. And eventually, these ideas become the low-hanging fruit. And like incrementally, like there's a release that all of a sudden turns on you know, bankless block producers or asynchronous execution. And it's not going to be like these big rewrites. Like, this is like the, um, it's, really, like, it's really important that we don't have those because those are super risky. And it's really fantastic that we're in a place where we don't need them, that engineers are able to like incrementally get there. It means that like we have stability between releases, you know, and like um, releases actually happen on time, and like every improvement is is like clearly better than the previous one. 
And, and just to double click on that, I mean, ultimately not having to rewrite the system, throw additional bandwidth at the network, throw additional cores, that really is an addition to the secret sauce, but it's predictable scalability. Yep. And it doesn't rely on some future ZK magic or other blockchains on top of blockchains on top of blockchains yeah. to scale. And like validators can do this without our help. This is kind of like, I think, the most important part of, I think, in my mind, of a permissionless scalable system is that the scalability is like outside of the core developers. We just built the protocol. If there's so much demand, like that literally like Solana is currently saturated, every validator under the sun is going to go order more cores from Amazon and just double the, the bandwidth because they're making more money. Everyone's happy. Like this, that's kind of like the, the best part to be in is when there's so much demand that you should be adding hardware to the network. Um, I'd love for that to happen someday, but like hardware gets twice, you know, twice as powerful every two years. It's an exponential curve. Um, and human population does not grow that fast. <laughs> so you've painted this beautiful picture. I guess what in terms of next steps do we have to get there? Obviously, Fire Dancer has been making a lot of progress. Uh, we've kind of outlined some of the upcoming network upgrades. But are there anything specifically outside of blood, sweat, and tears on the engineering side that we need to do to get to that envision? Um, like, there's already, like, uh, I mean, just yesterday, Andrew posted uh, an art, like a blog post on bankless leaders and the roadmap to get there. And there's a couple SIMDs out to relax some of the constraints on what a valid block looks like to get us there. So these are incremental changes that are all kind of happening in parallel. I don't know if there's, like, there's no, like, big thing besides those folks you know, like understanding the design and the, the goal we're trying to get and kind of slowly moving there. And can you maybe just briefly touch upon, in your mind, how big of a leap Fire Dancer is from today to the, the original Solana Labs client? So what's awesome is that I don't think there's any core protocol changes that the Fire Dancer folks are doing at all. So somehow, we got most of the design right like during those two years that we were building, uh, which is pretty cool. It's a cool feeling. <laughs> and they're rewriting this from the ground up. They kind of see the, you know, how the system's built. They can look at our code and be like, OK, why did you guys do that? <laughs> but like, understand the, the, the goals we were trying to have and rewrite it in their beautiful kind of hardware scaling tiling system that they've built with, with like shared memory that like just magically scales across as many cores as you have. Um, and they get to do this in C, which is super high performance. They never pay like a language penalty. They never use like a, a library that has like hidden allocations or anything like that. Um, if I had like infinite resources, I literally did start building Solana in C like the first week and I realized that there's no way I would finish <laughs> no matter how many engineers we hired. So we switched to Rust just to, to be able to, to finish it. But now I get to see that like, vision come to fruition. And I think engineers that are like, world class, and, and like, it's awesome. Um, the performance that they're really demonstrating is going to be, I think, uh, like groundbreaking in the sense that it's going to reduce the cost of the hardware for the current loads. You'll, you should be able to run on a, a system that's much, much lower requirements than what Solana runs on today. So when folks talk about, oh, Solana's expensive at 350 bucks a month, I don't know if it'll run on like a digital ocean droplet, but like close to that, maybe. <laughs> like if, if there, you can get a Solana validator for sub $50, the whole argument that it's too expensive to validate just goes away. So that's really exciting just from the optimizations they're doing to the software. The other side of it is that if they can really demonstrate that all you need is cores, and they've really solved all those problems to um, like the practical limit, like 20 gigabits, um, I honestly think like we're basically done. There's no more real protocol development that needs to happen outside of like improving the developer experience. And hopefully, a lot of that stuff is now happening in the compiler kind of like application layer where you don't need to make any core changes. Um, and that's, uh, I hate to say like it's a ossified protocol, but like that's 
It's ossified because it's done, not because we're like scared to make changes. That's a really, really awesome place to be. Hopefully that means that like the third client is much easier to write and the fourth client, like I joke about this, but like if you have three clients in two years, I should be able to tell ChatGPT5, go write me a fourth client, here's three examples of the protocol and, and we're done. <laughs> Awesome. Well, that is all the time that we have. Uh, Anatoly and Slana, consensus at the speed of light. Thank all you. Right. Thank you all. Thank you.